possible. So this session is really geared for people that are already on a pump and want to learn more about how to take advantage of some of the pump features. So put up your hand if you're on a pump. Okay, awesome. And, and how many of you are using CGM? Okay, the majority. Okay, fantastic. Can you hear me in the back okay now? Is that better? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, if, 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 you, if I start talking too quiet, yell at me, okay? Great. So Jeremy Pettis, uh, who used to be my friend till he assigned me this particular topic, because <laughs> um, I thought, Jeremy, uh, how you're, you're pressuring me now. So hopefully I'll live up to the title. Um, but what, to, what I want you to know is for over the next 40 minutes, okay, very important, over the next 40 minutes in this workshop, you're the doctor, okay? I'm going to be presenting cases, my patients, that have given me permission to show, okay, I'm not showing pictures, uh, they're them, and you are the endocrinologist, and you have to pr figure out what advice you're going to give to your patient. All right? Okay. okay. So, by way of background, this is what a healthy, before you develop type 1 diabetes, this is what your pancreas did. It always produced a little bit of insulin, including overnight, and when you were going to eat, as soon as you start eating, your pancreas, your islet cells would start to release insulin. So that's what, uh, in quotes, healthy pancreas does, and that's what, being on a pump, you're trying to replicate. Now, we're not there yet. You heard about the exciting ways we'll get there, but we're getting closer. So this is on a pump, what you do, right? You have your basal rates for between meals and overnight, and then you have your carb counting ratios, and you do carb counting to cover your meals. That's the basic, that's the foundational stuff you learned even before you went on a pump. So I'm assuming you know a, a few of the terms that, you know, SMBG means performing self monitoring blood glucose, finger prick, right? So uh, even if you're using a CGM, you've still so far, still have to do some finger pricks to calibrate your device. Now, I didn't have enough CGM slides to fit with the cases because a lot of my patients can't afford CGM, unfortunately. So I just, most of the cases I'm asking you to solve, I'm using blood glucose readings. Um, and I'm assuming that you know some basic terms. You know what basal rates, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And you know about carb counting ratios, okay? And how about sensitivity factor, correction factor? Yep. Okay, so how many of you, yourselves, without talking to your diabetes nurse educator or, or family doc or specialist, how many of you adjust your basal settings sometimes? Okay, about half. How many of you will reprogram your carb counting ratios in your pump? Okay, we're down to 25%. How many of you adjust your correction factor? And okay, down to about uh, 20%. And, and I find that's typical, that I find most people are pretty semi-comfortable with that, sort of comfortable with this, and this a bit nervous about. Okay, this is your first patient. This is your patient, Barbara. She's 54, type 1 for 10 years, otherwise well, and you just started her on a pump two weeks ago. And just like you, when you started on a pump, I bet most of you were started on one basal setting. That's the usual way it's done. Probably one unit an hour, more or less. And that means that every hour your pump gave you one unit over that hour. Okay, so that's one. I wrote it at the top, but it's the same hour after hour. And these are a pretty typical default carb counting ratios, about one unit for every 10 grams of carbs you're going to eat. These are just sort of often standard settings are used, and a correction factor of one unit for 50 milligrams per deciliter. So when you first started pumps, your, your, your pump may have had similar settings to this. Okay, so this is Barbara, new on a pump. These are her settings. So Barbara comes to see you after two weeks and shows you her blood glucose readings. Now these are before meal, before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner, bedtime, and 3 a.m. Okay, you're her doc, you have to help her. So what's wrong with her numbers? So, I'm gonna, uh, so we'll, we'll do a show of hands in a sec. I'll just read out the options. And do you think the problem is her fasting glucose is too high? Or is it before lunch that's the problem before dinner? Or do you think she's having blood, low levels at bedtime? Okay, who votes for A? 
Okay, B, C, D. Okay, so some people say D, most people say A, and some people want it to be anonymous and not cast a vote. <laughs> so I took a secret picture of you, and I'm going to pick on you personally after this. So um, I, I, although we could make a case for some of the other options, um, I think that in general, the problem would be here, that her glucose levels are running too high before breakfast. Okay. Now you're her doc. It's not enough to identify the problem. You have to help her. So how are you going to help her? Are you going to change her carb counting ratio so this makes it stronger that she'd get more insulin? So are you going to change your carb counting ratio at dinner to make it stronger so she gets more? Are you going to change your correction factor to bring her down better from a high? Are you going to increase her basal rate by 0.1 from 10 p.m. till 3 a.m.? Or are you going to increase her basal rate by 0.1 from 3 a.m. up to breakfast? Okay, who votes for A? B? C? D? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, so. I, but I'm starting off easy, it gets harder, okay, just so you know, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay, I've been diabetic for over 30 years, and I've been on a CGM for a long time. How do you know she's not dropping after 3 a.m. and she's rebounding at that point? Okay, time? beautiful. So the question is, which I'll repeat, how do we, right, so the question is, how do we know the real problem isn't she's going low overnight and then rebounding? How many of you ever heard of that term rebounding? Okay, so what I can tell you is this. I'm going to answer that question in one way uh, that will surprise you and one way that won't. So the, the easy way of saying that is she's only had diabetes uh, for 10 years. So within 10 years, most people s won't sleep through a lot. They'll, they'll recognize symptoms, but not always. But I'll tell you the more complicated answer is that. The, the medical term for rebound is called the SMOGI phenomenon. It was described years ago. Now I can tell you, if you were all doctors or nurse educators, 90% of you would say, oh, maybe she's rebounding. And for reasons I've never understood, never understood, most endocrinologists, family doctors, nurse educators, dietitians, and people living with diabetes know, don't know that rebounding does not exist. It's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, we're going to show that in another case. It's, it's, it's a misperception. It's a legacy of history. And it doesn't exist. There was an article published 20 years ago disproving it when CGM first emerged. But nobody knows it. But anyhow, so I don't want to get too sidetracked, so we'll, we'll carry. If my blood sugar dose is really low and I do nothing, I end up at 400. Right. So, so I'll tell you, we'll talk about that. It's a good question. We'll talk about it offline uh, after. If that's what, come up to me after. Okay, so fasting glucose is too high, so we're going to increase her overnight basal rate. Now, one point I want to make is this is 3 a.m., but she's eating breakfast several hours later. So one thing I find a lot of people sometimes don't think about when they're changing their basal settings, they don't give it enough time to actually work. So when you're changing your basal rate, just like you're helping this lady, Make the change three hours before the problem time. So if you're high at 7 a.m., don't change your basal rate for 6 a.m., change it for 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., like three hours at least before. Because I find a lot of people know the idea you need more, but don't go back far enough in time. So adjust your basal rate beginning about three hours prior to the problem. There's no point in general for having a basal rate set for just one hour. So this was a patient of mine, is a patient of mine, lovely lady, I love seeing her. When she showed me these rates, she was pregnant. Her A1C was 5'9". She was doing literally, I remember this like yesterday. How, how many people here have been pregnant? No men put up their hand, okay? So, <laughs> a few. so when you were pregnant, how many times a day did you check your blood sugar? 12. A long, so I remember with this lady, I asked her, um, <laughs> I, I said, you're, she was checking her blood glucose 24 times a day. And I said to her, I said, oh, you look like you might be low. Do you need to check now? She said, oh, yeah, I probably should. And she didn't get her to land. She said, I'll just squeeze the last hole. And <laughs> she did. I went, wow, you're impressive. That was like the most awesome thing ever. Um, so, so I did not make any change here. I knew that most of these rates were unnecessary. 
but she liked to change things. She was doing great. So who the heck was I to change anything just because science says it doesn't help? For her, it was working great. But in general, that's totally overkill. Do, I mean, really, this extra 1 20th of a unit going in over an hour, is that really going to make a difference? <laughs> really? I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't think so. OK, so what is the optimal number of basal, for most people, per 24 hours? 1 to 2, 3 to 5, 6 to 8, OK, who votes for this? OK, B, C, D. OK, so the, actually, before I, I want all of you, go in your pump right now. See how many different basal rates you have set per 24 hours, unless you already know off the top of your head. No, not temporary, just what you have pre-programmed. Yeah, I'm not talking about exercise, just talking about your default. What, you, what do you have? How many? Two, three, two. Four, seven, five. The last group had a lot more basal rates. I don't, I'm not sure who wins. So, so in general, in general, three to five is as much as you need. Now, if you find fewer work better, great. If you need more, it's great. But in general, that's enough. And that was looked at in a research study from a whole bunch of years ago, and it found that once you exceed four or five basal rates per day, you're not really giving each of those basal rates a chance to work. They're not active long enough. But okay. Sometimes it, like, it also helps with the, like, the Medtronic pump. Like I have one set at three and one set at four. Yeah. And sometimes I play around with the three o'clock one being the start. Sure, time, sure. That, that makes good sense. sense. Okay. Time. So you help Barbara because you were an excellent endocrinologist and you increased her 3M basal rate and her fasting readings are now a lot better. Congratulations, so you did a great job. So now at 3M she's 1.1. Okay, we're going forward now three months. Her before meal and bedtime readings are great, but her A1C is too high. Why do you think that is? <coughs> postprandial, what does postprandial mean? after meals. So most of you are using CGM. So you're aware of what's happening after meals. But before you were on CGM, you probably were not doing much post-meal testing. Because no. it's a pain. You're busy. And you were already doing four tests a day before meals in a bedtime, probably some extra. Very few people routinely check after meals because you're just busy with family and life and work and exercise. And who the heck has time uh, for that? Um, but for those of you not on CGM and therefore not aware of where you are after meals, if your A1C is too high but you're great before meals, make a point on your CGM or your finger pricks of seeing what's happening after meals because that's typically where the problem area is. And I can tell you in my practice, very few of my, just not CGM, my finger prick testers routinely check after meals. Because life is just tough. Life gets in the way. And you know, it's such a shame that Dr. Edmund has to leave right now. Really? <laughs> you know, as much as I would love for you to say, Steve, if you have to go, it's okay. Really. I'll look after Jamie when she arrives, all right? All right. Now, of course, I forgot where I was. Okay. So these are her problem areas, right? We said it was too high after uh, uh, breakfast. Okay, so what are you going to do to help her out? You're the doc. You have to know what to do. Are you going to tell her, you know, Barbara, you're doing okay. Just, we'll just leave things status quo. And by the way, not to insult my colleagues, that's what most doctors tend to do. Ah, oh, you're fine. That's not the way I like to practice. I don't think that's right. Do you want to increase her basal rate from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m.? Do you want to strengthen her carb counting ratio at breakfast? Or do you want to weaken her carb counting ratio at breakfast? OK. Oh, oh, there could be lots of other choices. I just have to narrow it down for, for argument's sake. OK, so, so if the, right. So one key thing about bolusing before meals, when do most of you, how long, if at all, before your meal do you bolus? Five minutes immediately after? Depends on what you're eating. Right, so, so, so there's this ideal theoretical world and then there's real life, yeah. right? Yeah. So the ideal theoretical, you know, isn't life all, you know, happiness and joy world 
is you bolus around 15 to 20 minutes before eating, unless you're using a Fresa, but for the other types of insulin. Real life is, oh my God, I forgot to bolus. I better do that right now, right? <laughs> That's real life. But when you can, try to bolus, not talking about a Fresa, talking about using your pump, try to bolus 15 or 20 minutes before. And, and most docs who did a lot of this knew that, and a study came out last year that proved that scientifically. It works better. Because the insulin has to have time to get into your body. If you bowl this right as you start to eat, your sugar's already on the way up before the insulin's doing anything. So when you can, I would recommend that. Okay, so who votes for A? Who votes for increasing her basal rate? Who votes for strengthening her breakfast carb counting? And who wants to make it weaker? Okay, so we have more or less of a consensus to strengthen her carb counting ratio at breakfast. And okay, so we did that. Two months later, so we've been modifying her pump settings. And again, this is per hour all the way through, changing her carb counting rec uh, uh, ratios. And now her A1C is terrific, right? Things are great. Now, fast forward a month. Her after breakfast readings, I, I didn't include this. I wanted to just point out this. Her after breakfast readings have become erratic. You know, high, low, and okay, high and low. And I see this a lot. I bet some of you have experienced this too. Things seem to be going great. And, and you, you, know, you feel like you deserve, and you do deserve, like a gold star, and then all of a sudden things get screwed up, and you haven't done anything different that you know of. Right. But there usually is a reason. You know, when, when your sugars go from being great to being not so great, sometimes we never figure it out. But usually there's a reason if we play Sherlock Holmes and figure it out. So for Barbara, again, this was a patient of, of mine, what is the most likely, you're her doctor, you have to help her. So what's the most likely reason that your patient Barbara now has erratic readings? Is it that her, <laughs> we're cutting to the chase, I see, okay. So, so, so what did we say, D? Or anybody want C? Okay, who, okay, we're gonna do it my way. Okay, who says A? Nobody. Pumps are pretty damn good. Okay, who says she's developed celiac? Anybody here have celiac disease? You do? So just celiac disease is a bowel disease where food doesn't get absorbed properly and it tends to cause all sorts of screwy sugars. So 5%, one out of 20 people with type one has celiac disease. Now there's more than 20 people here. The odds are that more than you have that. So if you find your sugars are all screwy for no good reason, up and down, ask your doctor to test you for celiac disease. Okay, because in this room, statistically, there's probably at least three people uh, with it. Yes? Is that the same as gastroparesis? No, we're going to come to that, but that's different. Okay, celiac disease. So if your sugars are screwy, ask your doctor if you've been tested for it. Uh, eating different types of foods. Okay, eating breakfast at different times. Okay, so most people say this, some this. So this is what actually was happening to my patient and now your patient, Barbara. She had been eating consistently at 7. But now, sometimes she eats a few minutes earlier and sometimes a few minutes later. Well, so what? That's only a 20 minute difference. Why do you think that screwed things up? What do you think was, and I see this all the time. She's taking the bolus at the same time. She ta thank you, exactly. I'm gonna repeat that answer in a second. So this was her pump settings. Her carb counting ratio at midnight was one to 11. Seven was one to nine. So if she ate breakfast at 10 minutes to seven, she got a totally different amount of insulin from eating at 10 minutes after seven. I see this every day in my office, every day. It, it's incredible, I see it often enough that when I was giving a lecture and Jeremy Pettos was in the audience, he said, whoa, can I borrow this slide? And so, not right now, but I really hope that you'll look at your own carb counting ratio times and I bet a handful of you are gonna find that you're eating breakfast in, at different times, even a few minutes apart, and getting a very different amount of insulin. So what I do with a patient like Barbara, I say, what's the earliest you ever eat breakfast? And if she says, oh, you know, once a week, you know, I'll get up at 6.30. I say, fine, we're gonna change your breakfast carb counting ratio to 6 a.m. so you always get the correct ratio you're supposed to get for breakfast, all right? Okay, so we'll skip ahead. Uh, what do you, you know, a whole bunch of you are on CGM. What do you think's the problem here? This is midnight, breakfast, lunch, dinner, bedtime. Technology. 
technology isn't good. I agree. <laughs> I want that damn bionic pancreas right now. <laughs> Bad doctor. <laughs> okay, it wasn't my patient. I lied when I said it was. Okay. What do you? What's the problem? So what, what do you think is happening here? So earlier someone mentioned about the dawn phenomenon. Okay, what's the dawn phenomenon? It's your liver. So the dawn phenomenon happens like there's seven billion people in the world. All seven billion people theoretically are prone to the dawn phenomenon because overnight our body makes certain hormones like adrenaline, and, and, and other hormones like that, norepinephrine, that make your sugar go up because it turns your liver into a sugar factory. In the absence of having enough insulin in your body, your liver overnight will release into your blood the equivalent of drinking two cans of Coke. That's the natural tendency, you have to shut it off. And the way if you have a pump on that you stop that from happening is what? You increase your basal overnight. So when you're reviewing your CGM data, if you find you're trending up overnight without eating, right? This person wasn't eating, then you probably need more basal overnight. And remember, start three hours before the problematic time. And so we adjusted her settings, and isn't this awesome? Like, yeah, made me feel really good. <laughs> okay, here's John, 44, type one for quite a long time, on a pump for five years. A1C is pretty darn good recently started exercising in the evening fairly vigorously but the problem is and it's frustrating him right exercise is supposed to be good for you you're supposed to get a pat on the back for exercising you're not supposed to be punished for exercising so since then his bedtime readings have been high when he exercises so why do you think that is yeah so his blood sugar may have been high to start with any other he may have taken his pump off. So that's exactly what he was doing. He was taking his pump off. He was disconnecting his pump when he exercised vigorously. Now, most people do that. If they're my patient, when they first see me, they're doing it. But hopefully by the second visit, they're not anymore. And the thing is, if you're doing vigorous exercise, what it, I mean, how many of you do sometimes, not all the time, sometimes you do fairly vigorous exercise? Okay, a whole bunch. What, do you, what does it do to your blood sugar? So in your case, it goes down. But in general, if it's intense, like we call anaerobic activity, in general, it, yeah, thank you, it makes your sugar go up, in general. Whereas if you went out for a three-hour walk at a more slower pace, that makes your sugar go down. Now, what I find, again, most people, until I convince them otherwise, they say, oh, I can't wear my pump when I'm out playing volleyball or hockey or basketball. It just gets in the way and I just don't want it on. But the, then the sugars go up and it interferes with performance. And I'm not saying you have to be a professional athlete to notice that. So, you know, I got this collection of pictures. So Max Domi, he plays in the National Hockey League. What is he, what is he wearing? He's wearing his pump. He doesn't take it off because he found when he took it off, his sugars went up when he was supposed to be skating down the ice on a breakaway and he was missing shots. You play a lot of hockey, play, I know you do, of course. <laughs> hey, the top player in the league is from Arizona, Steve. Come on. Um, Chris Jarvis was on two Olympic teams. Um, unbelievable guy. Steve's met him and he's wearing his pump. And I can tell you, and this, it, it irritates me to this day, when, when he was on the Olympic team, a few weeks before the Olympics, his coach wanted to kick him off the team, not for wearing his pump, but because he said he wanted to take dextrose tablets on the boat. Oh. And the coach said, oh, you can't do that, you're not allowed. Anyways, he appealed and won and was successful in the Olympics. Isn't that irritating? It just really gets me mad still. Um, what's Dustin McGowan wearing? Well, He's wearing a pump. He had a specially designed uh, pocket for his, uh, for his uh, pump there. And John Chick, uh, any of you ever hear of John? So this, you know, I, I've spoken with lots of uh, uh, famous uh, people uh, who present their own story, but that was my absolute favorite. So John is the biggest human being I've ever met in my life. He played in the NFL. 
and we were in the room, and he was about, you know, 15 feet high, and I was about like this, <laughs> and, and I was looking up at this giant, and, and he was talking about wearing a pump. And I thought it was so cool, because I, I said to him, well, what do you do with your pump when you're playing? Like, he's playing in the NFL, you know, he's 300 pounders smashing each other. And I, I, and, and I said, what do you do with your pump? And he looked at me like I was so dumb. And I, I thought it was an okay question. <laughs> and, and he said, well, what do you mean what do I do? I said, well, a lot of my patients disconnect. I said, you're playing, you know, smashing your body all the time. I said, what do you do with it? He says, I wear it. And I said, well, where do you put it? I said, patients are always telling me they're afraid it's gonna get smashed. He said, I put it in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> End discussion. Um, and he said it never got broken, never got scratched, and these pumps are resilient. And I thought, if he could play in the NFL wearing a pump during games, then when someone's out playing volleyball or whatever else, you can wear a pump. So I wouldn't, for those of you that do exercise uh, and don't wear your pump, I would encourage you to reconsider that. Um, okay, different exercises have a different, oh, some of these slides um, you may want so at my last slide is my email address. I can't email you all the stuff, but stuff like this I'm happy to, and some other slides, so you'll see my email address later. So this is, is by Mike Riddell, a friend of mine and a friend of Steve's, who's a kinesiologist, lives with type 1, does lots of research on exercise and type 1. And he's recapitulated here that there's certain activities from his research, intense exercise, you know, ice hockey, track, sprinting, um, that raises sugar, and, and other things, as some of you already said, tend to make your sugar levels go down. So you have to adjust your pump to accommodate for which of these activities you're doing and how you respond. So some key points uh, that he uh, came up with, uh, talking about temp, how many of you use a temp basal setting? Okay, most of you do. Do you feel comfortable that you know how to do it, or is it sort of wing, yeah, you do? Okay. I, I've <laughs> thank you. No, I love that. Thank you. See, do you want to tell us about it? Thank you. That's a beautiful segue. I will. And in fact, I'm going to do that right now. Right now. Uh, so this is how I would recommend uh, you do it. And I'm going to show you an online resource to learn more. So if you know from experience, because each of you have your own journey, right? And, you know, I, I tell my wife this uh, all the time. Like, I, I feel like I'm the luckiest doctor on the planet. I love my job. I love going to work. And I feel I learn, each and every patient I see, I learn something new because every person is different. And, and when someone says, oh, you know, they're all type one, like what the hell does that mean? Every person's different. So these are things that I learn. Um, so if you're make, doing exercise that makes your sugar level go high, use a temp basal increase so you aren't gonna go so high in general of 20 to 50%. I would recommend starting with a, a more modest amount and see how you do with that. But a lot of people don't do it soon enough. When I talk to folks, most people who do this do it immediately before the exercise. It's too late. You've already got too much insulin in your body. So I would encourage you to look at um, adjusting your basal setting starting about an hour to an hour and a half before the activity. You have to give it time for that insulin level in your body to change. And stop it, not right after you finish, but about an hour to an hour and a half after. Okay, I find some people do one or the other, but most people just don't feel comfortable or haven't been taught to do the whole package. Then the flip side, if you're doing blood sugar uh, exercise that tends to make you go low, use a temp basal reduction, same thing. Okay, so I, I, I would encourage you to think about trying this out. And if you're nervous, 50% reduction, you know, first time, Try 20%. If a 90 minutes seems too aggressive, try 30 minutes. Just play around with it, but try it out. And then watch out for going, how, have you ever had a low like at three in the morning after you exercised at night? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I can tell you most docs don't know this unless they do a lot of diabetes, is that most people think, oh, if you're gonna go low, it's when you're exercising. People don't know, you can go low like nine hours later, 12 hours, you've had that happen. We call it delayed hypoglycemia. So, you know, these are kids playing hockey, but it could be soccer, it doesn't matter. The point is if you are doing an activity in the evening that is fairly vigorous and it makes your sugar go up, 
then you're at risk afterwards for going low. So what, if this was your patient and you were giving them advice to avoid this, you'd probably tell them to do a temp basal reduction when they're going to bed. But not just for one or two hours, but for most of the night, if they know by historical precedent this is what happens to them. So this is a great website, xcarbs.com, and most of what I'm telling you is there, plus an interactive tool to help you figure out what changes to make to your pump settings. The folks that run this, most of them are healthcare providers, they're all high-level athletes, and they all have type 1 themselves. I refer a lot of my patients to this website. X, just think of exercise. They had to put the E before that to make sure it was family-friendly website. Um, so this is a great book written by Mike Riddell, high-level athlete, awesome guy, and it's designed to answer these very questions. I, I think, don't hold me to it, but I think you can download it uh, as a Kindle or, or one of those e-readers. Okay, here's Lois. She's 18 in college on a pump. A1C is sort of typical for someone uh, of that age. Blood glucose readings are too high after eating. Those are her settings. Why do you think she's high after eating? Do you think her basal rate's the problem? Eating disorder? Fear of lows? Miss boluses? Yes, Ms. Bolas is 18. Come on. Uh, inaccurate carb counting. So, so how, how many of you here, uh, there's a variety of, how many of you here had type 1 when you were a teenager? Okay. Keep your hands up if you never, ever missed a bolus. Okay. <laughs> I, come on. No hands should be up. Really? <laughs> it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Who knew? Yeah. Well, you were so young, I wouldn't have known that. That's right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, high blood glucose after eating, you know, remember to bolus. Try to bolus 15 to 20 minutes before, unless you're using inhaled insulin, which can be immediately before. And there's a new insulin. Have you ever heard of the new quick acting insulin? It's called FIASP, FIASP. So, FIASP isn't out in the U.S. yet. It is, I, I, I'm lucky enough to have it back home. Um, and it's a very quick-acting form of insulin and can be give, uh, given immediately before, or so they say, it's promoted as being given immediately uh, before. And use the bolus calculator. The bolus calculators, every pump has one, they're smarter than we are. And they take into account insulin on board, but I find a lot of people just get out of the habit of using it. So if you're not using it, I, I suggest you uh, look at that again. All right. So. I already gave the answer, but it doesn't matter. So look at those numbers. And what, what do you, I mean, these are different options, but anything you notice there? So they are kind of all over the place. If I was to pick out one thing that I would, uh, I would notice, that if, the, if they start off high, they, they end up high, right? They start off high, they end up high. So if someone's pump is set optimally, that's not going to happen. So what's the feature on your pump that helps to avoid that scenario, that helps to bring this down lower than there? It's your correction factor. And most people, including most people in this room based on a show of hands earlier, don't adjust that setting so much. And, and I find that in my practice too. Even though I look after 700 pumpers, only a handful routinely feel comfortable making a change to their correction factor, which is too bad. Because that's exactly the problem. If this person's correction factor was set correctly, that, including carb counting, would come down to a normal reading after. A correction factor? So what is the correct correction factor? What is it? Well, it depends on the individual. So each person's different. So I'd recommend if you don't normally adjust your correction factor, and if you find when you start off high before a meal, you end up high after, and you feel frustrated, right? And that happens to most people, I find. Speak to your healthcare provider, especially your pump trainer or nurse educator. And they'll mentor you, because people need to be taught this skill, but how to adjust, safely adjust the correction factor to bring that down. 
And in this case, it was a matter of strengthening her correction factor so that she got more insulin when she started off high than if she'd started off there for the same amount of carbs with the breakfast. Yeah. Um, Ginger Vieira's book, Your Diabetes Science Experiment, has a really good formula for doing that. Is there, I'm sorry, what does? Ginger Vieira's book, Your Diabetes Science Experiment. Your Diabetes Science Experiment. OK, okay. thank you. It's a really, she has a really good formula. OK, that works great. Really well. Thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate that. Okay, here's Bob. He's 18. He's your patient. You saw him in your clinic two days ago. Type 1 for six years, A1C is 8.5, blood sugars from 90 to 215. Typical dinner is pizza, <laughs> washed down with root beer and finished off with more pizza. Lunch is what is lunch, and breakfast is what is breakfast. <laughs> so this is my typical teenage uh, patient. So, there's three different types of boluses on a pump. Now, I can tell you, in my experience, 99% of people use this, 1% of people use that. So, actually, so let me, you're a different audience. You're very, truly, I don't want to sound stupid about it, but you're a very special audience. You're here today, and you're incredibly knowledgeable, really. I bet you're more knowledgeable than most doctors I've ever met in my life. So, how many of you use one of these? Put up your hands if you use either. Yeah, so about, well, about, about a third uh, use that. So, let, let, so if someone is like Bob, and most teenagers are, what, would you, what kind of bolus should he take with his dinner? And I'll come back and explain them more in a sec. This one, this one, or th who, who votes for this one? Put up your hands. Okay, who votes for this one? And who votes for this one? Wow, you guys are awesome. It's unbelievable. So why did you choose this one? I'm sorry? Yeah, thank you. So I'll repeat that. So the thing is, he's having multiple constituents to his dinner. Some are going to act quickly to raise sugar up quickly, and others are going to last longer, like fats, absorption, and so forth. So the idea behind this, this is the default insulin bolus, you press the button or on your remote and it gives your bolus over a short period of time. If, however, it's like Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner, you're sitting down, it's going to be like a three hour meal, but fairly evenly spaced out and proportioned, then you want to give your bolus over a longer period of time to cover the longer duration of your meal. But if your meal is made up of certain foods that are absorbed quicker and certain that are absorbed longer, like this guy, then that's a good choice. But I find most people either don't know about these options or don't use them. And if you don't, but you're comfortable with it, experiment. And if you're not familiar with them, I'd recommend you speak to your educator about uh, those options. Okay, and we'll skip ahead a little bit. Okay, in the interest of time, I'll, we only have seven minutes left. Here's Judy, 24, type one. Glucose readings are great. She had, now where I work, I work on the east end of Toronto, there's a lot of factories, a lot of shift work. And I find, I bet a lot of you do too, you know, I, I don't think anybody should have to live a, a rigid life. Like that's, that's not, you know, you should work your therapy, you know, around your life, not your life around your therapy. I really believe that. You know, Steve Edelman is gone now. He has a slide that he likes to show. I'm like a beef eater soldier, and he says, my sugars are perfect when I'm like this, and don't move and don't eat, <laughs> right? But once you start living your life, it becomes trickier. But I do find that if people work variable shifts, sometimes overnight, sometimes daytime, it's harder to manage diabetes. Diabetes does tend to respond better to consistency. But that's not real life. A lot of people work variable hours. So what's going to happen to her sugars? If we don't make any changes to her pump settings, her sugars are likely going to be screwed up because she's sleeping now when she used to be awake and vice versa. So one thing which I recommended to her is that we pre-program her pump with two different sets of basal rates. And I find hardly anybody does that. Who, who here has two different sets of basal rates? You know, one midnight, this and that, and a whole other second set. Okay, you do and you do. So why, why do you? Why did you do that? I actually have three. I have an off day, I have a work day, and I have a work weekend day, which is Lovely. 
lovely. So just to, to, to reiterate, she has three different patterns. I'll just say two for the moment. Those days when she's working, those days when she's not, because your life is different on your work days. You probably get up at a different time. The level of activity is different. And I find very few people take advantage of this feature in their pumps. But most people, Monday to Friday, have a different life than Saturday and Sunday. When you eat, what you eat, what time you get up, stress level, whether you're walking, you know, running around, chasing uh, kids in a school or something like that. So I find this really helpful that you can program your pump, all your pumps, you can program the second set of basal rates for shift. Lots of, any, any of the women here find that depending on when your menstrual cycle is, your sugars get screwed up? Do you have different pump settings for when you have your, you do, awesome, okay. Do you wanna hear it? You finished the lecture, okay, good. Um, <laughs> So weekends or work days, and then especially, I do a lot of, I love seeing pregnant patients. I tell you, if, like most wonderful uh, people to work with in the world. Um, how many women here ha were pregnant while having type one diabetes? Okay, a whole bunch of you did. So what did you find happened to your insulin requirements as soon as you gave birth? It went all wacky. It went all wacky. Anybody else have an experience like that? Well, so most people, as soon as you give birth, this doesn't apply to the men, as soon as you give birth, your insulin requirements plummet, plummet. So what I do, and it works amazingly well, so if any of the young ladies here are, are seeing being pregnant on the horizon, what, talk to your doctor about this option, that you pre-program, like because during pregnancy your basal rate requirements go up and up and up and up and up but they're gonna fall like off a cliff as soon as you have your baby. So what I do with my patients, and it works great, I pre-program a whole second set of basal rates, much, much lower than what they're on at that moment. In fact, I pre-program them to what they were on before pregnancy minus a third. And then it's heaven, as soon as they have the baby, instantly. They don't have to get out their pump and fiddle for 20 minutes trying to program it, they just press one button and it switches over to their new basal rates, which are much lower, and it tends to work great. Now, pregnancy is an extreme example, but if it, I would encourage you, those, those of you that don't use this feature, to see if it might have a place in your, in your, in your uh, life. Um, so I'll answer questions in a sec. So if you want to email me, I can't send you all the slides, but I'll show you the, the key slides that were just like information slides, like you know, with the exercise. Um, and, and this is my uh, email address. I don't know how I came up with that except that it's my name so I could remember it. So, uh, I have three minutes. I can try answering some questions. Yeah. What is, what is the time frame and what number are you looking for, like two hours after you know, if you think your basal is right and counted correctly, what is your ideal? What, what, what is my ideal post-meal uh, reading? And when. And when. So, so we don't really know what's the best time after a meal to check one hour, 90 minutes, or two hours. But I certainly like to keep readings, you know, significantly below 180, two hours after a meal, closer to 160. You know, glucose readings are going to be a bit higher than after a meal somewhat, but 160 would certainly be a, an excellent uh, value. Uh, yes? If I decide to check my blood sugar before I eat, then do the carb tell me what I'm going to eat, and then do the, the bolus, mm -hmm. not anything afterwards. And, and bolus when? Before, before I'm going to eat it, let's say 200, adjust for that compensation. Right. I'm going to have a meal with how many carbs, put, put that in there and take right. a bolus and it's supposed to balance it out. Right. Thank you. So what this gentleman is saying is he, he will count his carbs and then add that to the, and, and his glucose reading, and then the pump does the rest. And it does. So if you're using your bolus calculator, um, which a lot of people don't, but it sounds like you are, then you're right. It'll do all the math for you. Um, but a lot of people don't feel, they don't trust the bolus calculator. But, but I think people should, because if it's set correctly, it'll, it'll work very nicely. And I have time for one more question, if there is. Yeah. I have a question about the correction factor. So is the correction factor, that ratio, consistent regardless of how high the blood sugar is? Right. Or at higher, because it's my, I guess, subjective experience that at really, really high blood sugar. Right. Thank you. So, so the question was, should the correction factor be said different in theory based on how high your glucose is? So I think you're right. I think some people do need more, um, but I don't know of any way on a pump to set that parameter. You can change the time, 
but you can't actually you know, adjust it for how high the, the glucose level is. So I'll be up here for another minute or two. Thanks for coming. And you know what? I really I thank you for interacting. It makes my life so much easier and more fun. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.